Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. So I work at DC Metro, I've been there for about seven years, a uh, train mechanic and also do some safety compliance stuff. So as a man of faith, you know, you have to prioritize certain things, especially how you carry yourself. You gotta be a man of integrity. You wanna be honest, be truthful, uh, be willing to just endure some of the hard conversations that come up at work, right? Uh, that's one of my favorite scriptures is 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 58. It talks about being that uh, strong and immovable in the Lord and that nothing we do uh, is useless when we're working for the Lord uh, and also to work enthusiastically for the Lord as we're doing our jobs and you know it's just important for me to you know as we try to reach the lost and as we try to uh, minister to them or just to be uh, transparent be honest about you know weaknesses and you know things that you're going through in life because um, unbelievers and Everybody can relate to your testimony. They can relate to your story. That's just important to me, just to make sure that I'm shining the light at work in a shop atmosphere when all the guys are ragging on other people and this and that. I'm like, hey man, why, why don't you just try, let's encourage them. Let's try to find the good in people. Let's try to, you know, do something a little bit different, you know, and uh, it's contagious and you'll, you'll you notice that after, after a period of time. I'm James Berger and I want to encourage you to join me in sharing Jesus at work. Happy Sunday, church. Good morning. Glad to see each of you here. I wanted to, before we dive into a uh, lesson today, I wanted to, to share with you something that's been on my heart. I wanted to ask this church to start kind of uh, changing and, and, and adjusting a little bit in, in our culture. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention it today. I'm going to mention it for the next couple weeks or months or however long I need to. But uh, one thing that we do at ACC is we're constantly putting scripture that we, we talk about uh, on a Sunday morning up on the big screen and we also provide bibles for you underneath the, the chairs in front of you and each of us usually we have you know kind of a smartphone that has maybe a bible app on it and so for the most part it makes a lot of sense on a sunday morning when you got maybe a kid in tow or maybe two kids one in each hand and you got a coffee in one hand and a water and you got all sorts of other things it kind of makes sense sometimes to you know i don't need to bring my bible to church because they got a bible for me at church I want to ask if we can start shifting that a little bit and be a church that brings our Bible, a paper Bible like this, to church with you. Uh, and here's why. There's something really special. Not only are we going to learn how to use this Bible together, are we going to learn and become more biblically literate and find out where to find things and how to find things in our Bibles by using them together, uh, but there's something powerful about being able to to underline and write in your Bible and to put notes in the margins and to, to really kind of have a history of what God's been doing in your life written that you can bring with you. So I want to ask us to be a church. Bring your Bibles with you. If you don't own a Bible, uh, then I want to give you a Bible right now. So what you're going to do is you're going to reach into the, the chair back in front of you. There's a Bible. Write your name on it and take it with you. And now you have a Bible. And bring that Bible with you. Now, for whatever reason you forget to bring a Bible with you, we got your back, right? We got, we got the Bibles in the chair backs in front of you. Uh, but let's start bringing our Bibles with us. Those of you who already have been bringing your Bible, great. Those of us who are sometimes like, ah, it's, I use it at home, but I have a Bible at church. Bring your Bible. Let's bring our Bibles to church together. All right, my name is Matt. Uh, I serve at ACC as a lead pastor. And uh, we're starting a brand new series today that just makes a lot of sense. And here's why. Do you know that we spend about 150,000 hours on average in our lifetime at work. 150,000 hours on average you're going to spend at work. In fact, if you, if you kind of change that math a little bit into a percentage, of all the time that you are awake, 
in your, in your lifetime, on average, 40% of your life, of your awake life, is spent at work. That's huge. I mean, think about this for a moment. If we were to take the percentage of time we do other things, here's how much time we eat, here's how much time we watch TV, here's how much time we do this, here's how much time we do that. When you take all those math problems and you look it up and figure out which one's the biggest, for the most part, for, for many of us, the amount of time we spend at work is the most significant thing that we spend our time on in our awake life. And therefore, we ought to talk about that more as a church. What do we do with this most significant portion of our time, 150,000 hours in our lifetime? How do we take our work life and our faith life and make sure these things really kind of fit in nicely together? And I want you to know if you've already kind of tuned me out thinking, Matt, you don't know me I, right now, I'm not working. Uh, this this uh, series is for everyone in this room. Let me tell you why. If you work part-time, you're working. If you work full-time, you're working. If you are a stay-at-home parent, trust me, you know, you're working, right? You are working harder than I am. You are working hard. If you are retired, right, you have opportunity still to volunteer and to stay and to, to continue to work towards the purposes God has given to you. You're still working. If you are a student in this room, listen, you got a full-time job too. It's called school, right? You're working towards preparing for what, what God has next for you. And if you are in between jobs right now and you're thinking, well, right now I'm not working, uh, th this is for you too. I want you to pay attention to what God's word says about work and faith and how these two things go together because everyone in this room can benefit uh, as we talk about this, this significance of 150,000 hours, right? 40% of our awake life. I want to spend some time talking about it. And you know, the Bible... God's word is, has a lot to say about, about how we take faith in the work. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at that and kind of explore what the Bible says about our work life. And uh, today, specifically, we're going to look at that. Uh, you know, sometimes when I mention the phrase that we're going to learn about how to be a Christian and how to work and how those things go together at the same time, some, sometimes some really dumb ideas come to our brain. You know, like, hey, I think what Matt's going to ask me to do is something like this. Uh, yes, sir, uh, now that I've sold you life insurance, can I interest you in some eternal fire insurance? <laughs> That's a bad idea. Listen, don't do that, all right? If you're selling life insurance, uh, don't, don't do that. Or maybe, uh, sir, I see that you're on our mailing list, but are you on the lambs list of life? <laughs> you know, come on, just don't, right? So it's how, do we, <laughs> how do we take what God's given us to do vocationally and our faith and allow these things to blend together in a healthy way where we can make a, a lasting impact and work towards the purposes that God has given to us. That's what we're going to explore today. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, I ask right now that you would help each of us in this room to realize that you've called us into work in some fashion, that you call us to, to do something and to, to work towards uh, the purposes that we often just call work. I ask right now that you would help us to hear what you say about work in the Bible, that you would help us to see uh, why we do it and how we ought to do it. God, I pray right now that you would speak through me and give me clarity of speech. Help everyone listening, myself included. God, let me hear my own words in a way that each of us can be transformed by your word today. Uh, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name and we all say it together, amen. amen. You know, um, I want to, before I, I really dive in here, I want to dispel a few myths about work. A lot of people, here's the biggest myth in the Christian church about, about work, is that work is a curse. That, that work was one of the things that happened because of the fall. You know, back in the beginning, uh, there, there, there's the serpent and Adam and Eve and all this went down, and then therefore, as a punishment, there's now this thing called work. So we all kind of look at what we do as part of the curse. I want you to know that that's not true. In fact, before the fall, we see that in Genesis 2.15, it says that, that God put Adam in the garden and told him to work it. He was, he was given a job to do before the fall even happened, okay? The, the curse in the fall was hard work, work that's toilsome and troublesome and painful and that you don't really enjoy that's part of the curse. 
okay? But the work that God originally gave to us was, was good and fulfilling and, and, and right. A work in and of itself isn't a curse, okay? Here's another thing I want to dispel. Uh, you know, God works. Did you know that? And we see this actually in, in John 5, 17. God doesn't ask you to do something that he's not doing himself. Okay, he doesn't say, hey, why don't you guys go out and do all the work? I did that whole creation thing, and now I'm just on like a, a long-term sabbatical, right? No, that's not the way it works. He calls you to work, and he's also in the background working. He's working in your life. He's working throughout this world. He's working building his kingdom. God is working, and he calls us to be a part of that. That's pretty cool. Another thing that I want you to know, and, and uh, this might be a bummer to you, I hope it's not, but we actually know that there's going to be work in heaven, that you're going to have a job to do there. Uh, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, things are going to be put back basically the way they were uh, before the fall. And we know that Adam, before the fall, was given a garden and asked to work it. So what I do know is that we will all have a job to do. It's going to be fulfilling. It's going to be joyful. It's going to be something we want to do. It's going to be awesome. But there's going to be work as part of our, uh, not only part of this life, but part of the next. And I want you to know that. Work is not, listen, work is not a bad thing. But here's the problem, is that work is often something that we don't enjoy very much. In fact, Solomon, who's the wisest, one of the wisest men to ever live, he says in Ecclesiastes 3.19, what many of you think about your job when you come home from work. He says, what do people really get for all of their hard work? Now, you know, if you're being honest, that there have been days you come home from school, you come home from, from work, you sit down uh, on the couch at the end of a long day with your kids, and you sit down there and you think to yourself this question, what is the point of this, right? Man, this is tough. I don't really enjoy this. It wasn't fulfilling as much as I thought it was going to be. And we all have these really bad days at work, and, and it, we end, our, end up kind of asking ourselves this question, what do people really get for all of this hard work? So what I want to do is I want to answer that question, and I want to give us today uh, what we're going to call four reasons we work. Four reasons we work. And the first one is this. It's to meet our needs. It's to meet our needs. Uh, and here, here's what I mean by this. Um, well, you're probably all familiar with uh, the Seven Dwarfs little song they sing, right? Hi-ho. Hi ho, help me out. It's off to work we go. But well, we can actually change that. In our understanding, the song sounds a little bit more like this I O, I O. It's off to work I go, right? We all understand that in the mail tomorrow, uh, well, tomorrow is a national holiday, a federal holiday. So on Tuesday in the mail, I'm going to get a bill. And the day after that, I'm going to get another bill for something. And we, we keep getting these people who say, hey, you owe us. You used our electricity, you used our water. You're living in the house that we own, right? All the, whatever, and we're going to get these bills in the mail. We're going to have to put food on the table. Essentially, one of the most basic reasons that we work is to meet our needs. In fact, one of the reasons why I know that most of you in this room right now are working to meet needs is that on average, two-thirds of you would switch jobs right now if you had the option. You don't like what you do. You don't want to do it. You don't feel satisfied in it. You don't like who you work for, you don't, whatever. I don't know the reasons, but two-thirds of people say they're not satisfied in their job and would look for something, or if something else better came up, they would, they would switch and take it. That being said, I know that the fact that those two-thirds are still working understand that they're working to meet needs. There's a reason we, we kind of stick to it. Proverbs 12, 11 says it this way in, in a, the message paraphrase. It says, the one who stays on the job has food on the table. Can't be any simpler than that. Listen, if you stick at it and you work hard, you're going to have money to put food on the table. Now, the Bible also says, though, you don't want to just meet your need. When it says to meet our needs or meet your needs, it's, uh, it's part of that your, our, is, is your family, right? You don't want to just go to work to meet your own personal selfish needs. You want to go to work to not just meet your needs, but the needs of your family. And here's, here's how we see this in Scripture. In 1 Timothy 5.8, it says, But those who, don't, who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, 
have denied the faith. Now get ready for a gut punch, all right? Tense up your abs a little bit because this one's going to hurt. It says, such people are worse than unbelievers. Let me explain what that means. Notice in this verse it says that those who won't, not those who can't. I want to clarify real fast. If you're in this room right now and you're in a season of life where you can't work, in other words, you have a disability or something preventing you from being able to get a job, uh, this verse isn't talking about you. This is for people who are able to, and for whatever reason, maybe it's laziness, maybe they can't hold a job because they don't ever show up on time, they don't take their job seriously. Uh, I don't know what your reasoning is, but for whatever reason, you're able to provide for your family, but you don't. The Bible says these, these very harsh, harsh words to us, such people are worse than unbelievers. It's amazing to me how entitled uh, we, we're going into kind of like an, a, 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 every day I feel like our culture becomes more and more entitled. Let's just say that. And I want to I wanna show you an um, editorial that was submitted to the LA Times. This is legitimate. I didn't make this up. I'm going to read this to you. This is someone who wanted to share their opinion about work with the LA Times, and this is what they said. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism lately for people who do not want to work, especially when they're collecting welfare. Now, most people prefer to work, and that's fine for them. But others prefer to sit on a bench at the park or go to the beach or observe the wonders of nature. Those who dislike working should be or should not be penalized by being deprived of the benefits of society. There is plenty enough for everybody. Listen to this. Everyone does not feel the same way about working. Some people, some people, have built-in feelings about work that can make work very unpleasant for them. <laughs> Especially when they're required to work. These feelings could be looked upon like a handicap. We do not punish others with a handicap, and society provides for them. We should do the same for those with a natural dislike for work. We should each live and let live, and let each person live in their own style. Can you imagine? <laughs> the, the, the overall just idea built into this opinion of, you know, some people just don't like working, and we shouldn't hold that against them. In fact, we should treat it like a disability and meet their needs. Y'all, this is true. I want you to, to know this. Wherever there is freedom, there's freeloaders. I want you to know that. Amen. You know, one of the, the most famous pilgrims way back before the United States was the United States was uh, James Smith. And James Smith uh, wrote, he, we have written down a lot of the words that he wrote in, in things. And one of the, the phrases he put a rule the pilgrims live by. He says, for the labors of 30 or 40 honest and industrious men shall not be consumed to maintain 150 idle loiterers. So essentially what he was saying was, we have a rule here in this new America that if you don't help harvest and don't help prepare and don't help grow and, and the food, you don't get to eat it. You know where he got that from? It's in the Bible. Let me show you. In 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul's writing, he says, Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Again, I want to remind you that it says those who are unwilling to work, not those who are unable to work. The Bible says that if you're unable to work, you shouldn't eat. The Bible also says, listen, in, in the, the end, I think, of James chapter 1, James one twenty seven, it says um, that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and to look after widows in their distress. And basically to, to not be, you know, not to model the world, but ultimately to take care of people who are not able to take care of themselves. 
We as a church are called to make sure that when somebody is not able to provide for themselves, that we provide for them. But for those of us who are able and you're not willing to work, the Bible says you should starve. You should go hungry. You see, essentially we work because it helps to meet our needs and the needs of our family. So let me ask you, let me uh, draw a little graph with my hand here. If this is you at the beginning of the week, zero dollars in the bank, and you know that right when you get to this spot right here, you're able to, to buy all the groceries you need, you're able to put gas in the car, you're able to pay all your bills. We'll call this like living paycheck to paycheck, right? If you can figure out that you're meeting your needs by making this much money, and this point right here, right, is, is let's say 32 and a half hours into your week. Does that mean at 32 and a half hours you should just punch out and be like, I'm done, met my needs, met my family's needs, I'm good, I'm out of here. Right? That's not quite the reason. If, if the only reason we worked was to meet needs, then maybe you just clock out as soon as your needs are met. But we know from the Bible that God calls us to something greater than just meeting our needs. In fact, I want to go as far as to say there's a word that's tossed around in churches recently that I feel like we should reclaim. It's the word prosperity. And right now within the church, uh, there's, there's this thing that we call the prosperity gospel. And this is not a church that subscribes to the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is something like this. That, hey, you go out and you, you, you work and you get, uh, do stuff for God. And then he's going to bless you and bless you and bless you and make you so prosperous. And you get to take all that stuff and all the things that you kind of are on your, your dream board and all the things you've ever wanted. He's gonna, he wants to bless you with all those things. That's the prosperity gospel, and I don't, I don't believe that to be true, but I, I do know that God wants you to prosper. God is not a God who is opposed to prosperity. He's opposed to greed. He's opposed to selfishness. He's opposed to you storing up a bunch of stuff for yourself, but he's not opposed to you prospering. In fact, l- l- let's look at that in Proverbs 13. It says, lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will what? Prosper. In other words, you can go into the workforce and you can more than just meet your needs. You can work hard and you can prosper. And that that prosperity, that's everything that happens, you know, here's meeting your needs. Everything over here, this is prospering. This is getting more than you need to meet needs. And God has a plan for what he wants you to do with that too, and then there's, uh, that's where we get a little bit uh, kind of in the muddy water of what the prosperity gospel is. I think that God wants you to use that, that, that leftover for something more specific than just meeting your own desires. But I don't want to talk about that today. Uh, let me give you another reason why we're called to work. And it's to use our gifts. It's to use our gifts. Now every one of us, we, we, th- we teach this word here at ACC called shape. All of us have a unique shape, and shape is an acronym, S-H-A-P-E, right? The S stands for spiritual gifts. All of us have unique spiritual gifts. The moment we give our life to Christ, you get a gift from the Holy Spirit. That's a spiritual gift. We each have a unique heart. In other words, we're, we're passionate about different things, and our unique passions are different. Our A stands for abilities. All of us are good at different things, You might be really good at something, and the person next to you isn't any good at that thing. We each have different personalities, right? There's some extroverts in here and some introverts in here and everything in between, and we also all have unique experiences. You see, college or school, that would be like an experience. If you went and learned how to be an engineer, the experience you have in that is going to set you apart from me because I don't have any of that training. So each of us has a very unique shape. Like there's someone in this room right now that if I were to go into your master bedroom closet, all of your shoes are lined up in an orderly way. In fact, all of the blue shoes are next to each other, and all of the red shoes are next to each other, and all of the black shoes are next to each other. Right now, you think to yourself, well, isn't everyone like that? <laughs> no. In fact, if that's you, you're the only one in the room right now who does that, okay? <laughs> you are the only one. Now, that's not bad. I'm talking to someone in the room right now. They're like, I think he's talking to me. I'm so glad that God gave you that unique shape of being overly organized. Organization is part of who God made you to be. How do you take that 
and, and use it? How do you organize in a way that, that can, can build God's kingdom and, and can work towards his purposes in your life? See, that's really, really important for us to know is that each of us has a uniqueness about us. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says this, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. In other words, God has given you gifts. He's given you spiritual gifts specifically mentioned in this verse, but he's also given you abilities. He's given you a passion and he's given you uh, experiences. He's given you these things, not so that you can make much of you, but so that you can use them to make much of him. He's given you these things so that you can use your gifts to, to build his kingdom. And we also see in Galatians 6, it says, pay careful attention to your own work. In other words, don't worry about what the guy next to you is doing. How many of you decide the level of quality of work that you're going to do based on the, the output of the people on your right and your left? Like, oh, they're only making 10 widgets an hour. I guess I can slow down a little bit. Because 10 is the number. But it says, no, no, pay careful attention to your own work. And then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Because the truth is that the people on your right and on your left, they're different than you. And if you find yourself focusing uh, specifically on using the gifts that God has given you and doing everything you can to do great work, like this verse says, you won't have to worry about what other people are doing or what they're choosing to do with their lives. What God has called you to, do it with greatness and do it with excellence. In fact, I want you to look to the person sitting on, the, on either side of you and say, thank you for not being me. <laughs> you see, the truth is, church, if all of us were just like one another, if all of us were gifted in the same way, we would just have a whole bunch of a, one widget and have nothing else to show for all of our, our, our you know, God, God's creativeness and his creativity wouldn't be displayed in that. Each of us is unique, and we have the ability to use our gifts through work. You know, God has gifted each of you on purpose. And what I mean by that is each of you has a purpose. God has a calling for you, something he has built you and made you uniquely useful for and he knows what that is. He's built that into you. If you're in this room right now and you feel like, you know, I don't have a purpose. I don't know what mine is. Uh, you do have a purpose. You might just be confused as to what God's calling you to. And what happens is if you don't know what your purpose is, uh, you're not going to find abundance in your life. If you have a life that doesn't have purpose, you're going to find yourself a little bit depressed. In fact, here's how Proverbs 12, 27 puts this. A lazy life is an empty life. Those of you who have the ability to work and to use your gifts, when you take them and you put them to work with excellence, instead of having an empty life, you're going to find abundance in that. Use the unique you that God made you to be to do incredible things for him. So if right now you're feeling like your life lacks meaning or you're feeling a little empty, I want to ask you, maybe it's that you have too much time on your hand that's not being used for God's purposes. Maybe you're retired and you find yourself with just too much, too much time on your hands. Maybe put those hours to work as a volunteer. Maybe you're a student and you're not really doing your best work. You're going to find that that leads to feelings of emptiness. I want you to know that um, before we move on to this next thing, Adam back in the garden, uh, when in Genesis 2.15, when God assigns him to work, he uses the word that I'm going to have you tend this garden or work this garden. The word there that is used for the, the word work is the word abad, okay, the Hebrew word abad. And abad, what it technically means is to prepare and develop. So what he's telling, what he's telling Adam to do is to go out and into this garden and prepare it and develop it. And, and remember what God says about creation after he creates everything. He looks at it and he says, it is good. 
right? Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say it is perfect. He says it's good. And then he says to Adam, Adam, I'm going to put you in the middle of this good thing, and I want you to work at preparing it and developing it and making it better. Adam was actually included in part of God's plan to make the the world that was good that God created to make it better. And we have the ability to allow God to use us to continue his creativity and to continue his creation and continue his goodness in in this world. Let me show you a verse that is intriguing. This verse has nothing to do with work at first glance, all right? So uh, this isn't a mistake. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Let's read this together. Not out loud, just, just follow along with me. Psalm 147, verse 3, it says this. For he has strengthened the bars of your gates and blessed your children within your walls. He sends peace across your nation and satisfies your hunger with the finest wheat. So essentially what's happening here is we have this verse where God is getting the credit for four different things. It's saying God, right, is is strengthening uh, the the bars of the gates and God is blessing your children and God is bringing peace and God is making sure that that no one goes hungry. And it's this verse that's kind of giving God credit. But Martin Luther later wrote a, a, a sermon about this verse. And what he said in that was, do you know how God does these things? He does them through your work. I want you to think about this for a moment. How has God strengthened the bars of the gates? It's through engineers that he's done that. It's through city planners. It's through uh, wise people who know how to do that. It's through metal workers. How has God um, blessed our children? Well, how about with excellent teachers and incredible stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home dads. How about incredible uh, pediatricians? How about daycare workers that are pouring into our kids? That's how God has allowed this blessing on our children to happen. How about sending peace across our nation? How does God do that? He does that through, through our police. He does that through our military. He does that by, by, by using people, right, to, to do that. And how about this? How does God satisfy our hunger? How does God do that? He does that through restaurant owners and through chefs and waiters and waitresses and farmers. And he he does that through us. The work he gives us allows him to, to fulfill these promises. God does what he does through us and through our work. And God has given each of us a unique gift that we need to use for those purposes. Here's another reason why we work. We work to glorify God. We work to glorify our God. Not only do we meet, uh, you know, just meet our basic needs through work, and not only do we use our gifts when we work, but we can actually use work in a way that's worship. Now, in that second, or sorry, in Genesis 2.15, in the second chapter of Genesis, that word work, that word abad I was telling you about, believe it or not, abad is actually the same root word that we use for work is the same root word that we use for worship. So we, we know that work and worship, that we can actually go into work as a form of worship. We can worship God through our work. And that's a really powerful thing. I want to show you kind of a neat example of that. In Exodus 31, we get to meet these two guys, these two, two real guys that, I was going to say characters, but that makes them sound made up. Two real guys that lived back in early Bible times in Exodus 31, Their names are Bazalel and Aholiab. And the Bible talks about these two guys. And here's what Exodus 31 says about Bazalel and Aholiab. It says that they were filled with the Spirit. That sounds pretty cool. But then it goes on to tell you what that means. Why were they filled with the Spirit? What about these two guys was different than everyone else? And it goes on to say essentially this. Because they did excellent work. These two guys went into their jobs and they did excellent work. And through that, through the the worship that occurred in doing their jobs well, they were filled with the Spirit. That is so cool that you and I can be filled with the Spirit. We can be in the middle of worship. We can worship our God through our work by doing it with excellence, by doing it greatly. 
That's awesome. Colossians 3, verse 23 and 24 says this, work willingly at whatever you do. Let's pause right there. Here's what this verse says. Hey, I was going to say on Monday when you go to work, but most of us are off tomorrow. Uh, On Monday or on Tuesday or whenever you go to work next, listen, go willingly. And what the scripture says right here is want to go. And then it goes on, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and the master you are actually serving is God. So what the Bible calls us to is to go into work, and I want to ask a question. I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want to get anyone in trouble here, but do you have a boss that's a jerk? Listen, listen. (laughs) Yeah, cameras, don't zoom in. Um, whether whether your, your boss doesn't treat you well, whether or not you're not getting the encouragement and the motivation or pay that you think you deserve, whether he or she isn't taking care of you the way he or she maybe ought to as your employer, I want you to know this. It's okay, you're not doing it for them. You're not working for them. This verse says that do whatever you do as if you were working for the Lord rather than for him or her. Do you have a diff- don't raise your hand. <laughs> Difficult coworkers? Listen. That's okay. You're not doing it for them. You have rude customers? Listen. It's all right. You're not going to work for them. You're doing what you're doing for the glory of God, as if you're doing it directly for him. So if you are, if you, if what you're going to be doing this week is stapling papers, I want you to know, I want you to be the best dang stapler this side of where, I mean, I want, why can't we be the best at what we do? If you staple papers for a living, listen to me, staple papers for the glory of God. Be the best at it. If you fix cars for a living, fix cars for the glory of God. If you protect our country for a living, I want you to protect our country for the glory of God. If you are watching children or keeping home uh, this week, if that's the work that God has called you to, I want you to, to do that for the glory of God. Whatever God is calling you to, I want you to do it. If you're uh, maybe retired and you're volunteering in some capacities, I want you to volunteer with all that you got for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it for him. If you're a student, listen, students, I want you to go into that school and I want you to bring your homework home and I want you to do your best. I want you to do that work with excellence because you're doing it, not for yourself, not for your teacher, not for the principal or superintendent. Do it as if you're doing it for God. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Think about this phrase for a moment. Money, or sorry, meaning matters more than money. And what what this, this is basically saying is that when you understand the purpose that you have, when you understand that God has a specific way for you to use your gifts, and that you had the ability to ultimately fulfill your greatest purpose, which is to worship God and bring Him glory, that when you understand that meaning in your life, that whatever you're called to, whatever you're maybe not feeling called to, but you got to do this week because you got to meet the needs of your family, whatever it is that you do, I want you to know that when you have uh, meaning in it, when you know that you're doing it for the right purpose and you're doing it to glorify God and to meet the needs of your family, that is more important than just earning a bunch of money. Meaning matters more than money. I also want to warn us all When I say that we can work as worship, what I don't mean is we should not worship our work. There's there's, sometimes we we get confused, and we end up spending so much time at what we do, and we're so passionate about it that it becomes a form of worship. We're not called to worship our work; we're called to worship God. Worship God, not work. Worship God, not the money that your work provides. 
Worship God, not the identity that you find in your work. Worship God, not the power that you find through your work. We're called to worship God while we work. And here's the fourth reason, and this one's kind of a cheat because we're not going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about it next Sunday. The fourth reason we work is to share our good news. The fourth reason that we need to to work, that we need to do everything that we do with everything we got in us, is that we have the ability in that to share our good news. 150,000 hours of your life you are spending in this. How do we use those hours to, to, to really experience what we would call the greatest mission field that most of us will ever be on? How do you take that 40% of your awake life and live for Christ in a way where you have opportunities to share your faith in the workplace? What kind of employee do you need to be to do that? How do you share your faith at school? How do you share your faith with your children at home? How do you do those things? We're going to talk about that next week. So as I invite the band back on stage, our worship team, I want to... Um, close with this thought. What now? What do we do with this information? What now, God? Um, Before I I suggest what I want you to consider, uh, the late Jerry Falwell was famous for a quote that I used to hear often as a Liberty student. And here's what he said. He said, if it's Christian, it ought to be better. And here's here's what I believe. God's calling you to. Those of you who are followers of Christ, when you go into the workplace this week, this month, for however many years God calls you into whatever work you're doing, as a follower of Christ, you ought to be the best at what you do. You ought to go into your work and put everything you've got into it. You ought to to go into those opportunities recognizing that you represent kingdom of God in the work that he's calling you to. So go into it giving 100% because if it's Christian, it ought to be better. Here's here's a thought I want to give you for a what now. And write, you know, you can write whatever you want. If God puts something specific on your heart today, and maybe your what now is I need to go get a job. Maybe your what now is I need to look for another job. Maybe your what now is I need to do better at, at taking my job seriously. Maybe I need to stop comparing my output to the person next to me and I just need to do the best work I got. But here's here's a suggestion. Whatever work God has called you to do, do it. Using your unique gifts, meet real needs to glorify God through excellence. Let's pray together. God, I want to take a moment and on behalf of, of this church, as a representative of this church, God, we we corporately right now, we thank you for work. We know that work is something that you provided to us, that it's not a curse, that it's a part of your plan to include us in what it is that you're doing as we prepare and develop and and do everything we can to make this a better place. God, we thank you for an opportunity to meet needs. God, I I right now, I, I pray on behalf of those with jobs in this room. God, we thank you for our employment. We thank you for the opportunity we have in it to meet some real tangible needs of ourselves and our families. God, I pray for anyone in this room right now that is looking for work, that right now they're not employed, right now they're not uh, providing the way they they should. God, I pray is that as they're searching for employment, as they're searching for an opportunity, that you would lead them to the right place where they can use their gifts to glorify you. And God, for those of us right now that have been uniquely gifted, and that's every one of us, God, we thank you for the gifts you've given to us. Thank you for making me unique. Thank you for making each of us unique, that we can use those gifts to fulfill the purpose that you've given to us through work and and life and faith. And God, I also, I thank you right now for the opportunity that we have to worship you with our work. I pray that as we go into work this week and beyond, that you would teach us what it looks like to worship you by doing what you call us to with excellence. Let us represent you well. And God, I invite everyone back next week. God, thank you for the opportunity we have next week to talk about what it looks like to share our faith 
at work. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.